Hi everyone, I'm Benjamin and welcome to my book club. I just finished Berserker by Fred Saberhagen and I'm going to try and rate every story inside. Let's get to it. So this is the first story in Saberhagen's Berserker War series, which at this point I believe totals about 13 books, according to Amazon. It's set in this war against, between humanity and these ancient evil machine intelligences called Berserkers. They're, the Berserkers are huge, almost moon-sized black ships covered in shields and weaponry and marks and dents and wounds of centuries or millennia of fighting against life. Their only goal and their only want is to destroy all life in the galaxy. They were created millennia ago by a race that we only know as the Builders. All knowledge of the Builders has been lost. We don't know why they created these machines. We don't know why they created these weapons. We don't know what happened to them. We don't know what drove them to create something that's only goal was to destroy life itself. We do know the Builders were themselves life, so did the Berserkers destroy the Builders, or are they still out there somewhere, protected somehow by some safety switch or something? We don't know. Once the most powerful weapons to have ever existed in the galaxy, the Berserkers are still, still hold on to that top spot, but after millennia of fighting against life, they are becoming damaged. Their, their armour is being torn open, shields are malfunctioning, Weapons are running low on ammunition or on power. Um, even their intelligences seem to be maybe weakening. Um, and the Berserkers are beginning to become a bit wary of this. Whereas before, they threw themselves into battle knowing that they were invincible. Now they have these scars and these wounds and these weak points that can be um, exploited. And it's at this time of the weakening Berserkers that humanity is takes its turn um, in the sights of the Berserkers. And as with a lot of these stories, humanity proves to be this warlike race taking the, taking our warlike um, symptoms of history and translating that into the war against the Berserkers. The book is a short story collection. Um, I believe they were published separately to begin with and have now been um, collected in this book, um, published in 1967, I believe. My copy was published in 1970, which explains a bit of its condition. Um, it's got a Great cover, that's why I bought it. I didn't know anything about this book when I found it in the store, but the cover was just... I couldn't get past the cover. Um, the spine's all beat up, but... Yeah, this Penguin science um, fiction copy, I'm a real, real big fan of. So it's 11 short stories, and they're held together by a series of introductions and thoughts by this alien intelligence from a race known as the Karmpan. They are these pacifist aliens that can somehow reach out and touch minds of other beings and, and humans in, in particular. Um, and he mentions in the first couple of pages that the Karmpan themselves as pacifists owe their existence to humanity. Um, and it's because of this that he's going to try and collect the story of this war, of humanity's war against the Berserkers. So I'm going to try and give a brief description of each of the stories um, and then try and rate them um, each out of ten. Um, let you know why I gave it that rating and what I thought of it. I'm going to do it it's spoiler free, I hope. Um, and at the end I'll give you a th my thoughts on the book as a whole and whether I think I'm going to continue with it. So the first story is Without a Thought. Um, and it's a great opener to the book, I think. We're introduced to the human's tactic at this stage of the war against the Berserkers. We've discovered that three ships, a three-pronged attack with atomic weapons, um, can defeat the Berserkers. That they are unable to defend themselves against these uh, these attacks. However, the Berserkers also know that this is their weakness, so they strive to not put themselves in a position where they can face an attack like this. In this story, we are introduced to the Berserkers as a whole, and the level of awe and terror that they can inspire in, in men. Um, and we also see that that trait of humanity that's become that's become a trope in these sort of sci-fi stories of of standing up in the in the face of certain death. Knowing that you're almost certainly going to die, but knowing you have to be the one to do this fight or others may, may be hurt. In this case, the Berserkers on the way to a planet to destroy it with billions of lives on it. And we have two ships 
awaiting the arrival of a third. They know that they can't attack now, that with two ships they can't hope to win, and they know that every second they wait for the third ship, the Berserker might just reach out and attack. Right now, the Berserker seems to treat them as though they're insignificant, they don't matter. Um, but at any moment he could change his mind and attack them and completely annihilate them. They know that they're likely to die, but if they don't stand here, there's no one else between the Berserker and the, and the billions of people on the planet. The Berserker takes this chance to try out one of its new weapons, uh, a mind-altering sort of weapon, which is, I won't spoil it, but it's really interesting. I don't know if I've ever read any th a weapon that has this effect on someone, um, and it's trying out this weapon to see if it's time to attack, because it, because it might or might not be working. Um, it also has a really interesting, I guess, like almost computer science-y problem in it, and the problem solving that the characters go through to, to, to solve that and beat that issue is really interesting. Um, as an introduction to the book, I thought it was great. I thought it introduced the, the main enemy of the Berserkers. I thought it introduced sort of their almost aloofness. They want to destroy all, all life, but to them, we are but ants, so... Um, so they don't need to spend that much time thinking about us. And it introduced humanity's response to it and our problem-solving skills that may make us unique in this war. Um, I gave this story a 7 out of 10. The next story is titled Good Life and is a story about the prisoners and the humans that are stuck on the Berserkers because the Berserkers take prisoners sometimes um, after their battles and it goes through what these prisoners might experience. The main character of the story is titled Good Life. The story is, is named after them. They are a human that seemingly was born on the Berserker. They don't know any other life. They've been raised by the Berserker and seemingly have had no other human contact up until this point. He's terrified of the machine, but the machine is both mother, father, god, and torturer to him. He's terrified of these punishments that it can hand out which seem to be something along the lines of activating all your pain receptors and causing unimaginable pain, but without causing any real damage. And the machine threatens him with these punishments throughout the book. Um, he's told by the machine to go meet some new prisoners that the Berserk has taken on board. And the story is about those prisoners interacting with good life and good life being split between these other humans he's just now been introduced to the first time struggling with that with the emotions that that causes as well as his loyalty to his father the berserker um and it's a it's a good one i i really enjoyed this one as well it was i liked the character of good life i thought he was complicated um i thought the berserker um the dialogues with the berserker gave us a glimpse into their thoughts um and also in this story we get a get our first glimpse at the builders and that's that's really fascinating um, I gave this one also a 7 out of 10. The next story is Patron of the Arts. Um, and this is, I, I think we've all maybe read something like this before, but this was in 1967, so... Humanity's worried that the soul system is going to come under attack and decides to ship its greatest artworks and paintings and sculptures to another planet. Along with them, a famous painter who's full of apathy and nihilism and is... is questioning himself why we're even fighting this war what what is life worth why, why are we fighting on life's side um in the sort of down depressing artist sort of trope um requested to go on board because he wanted to go live with the the, the artwork instead of living with humans um he was granted this and is on board the ship the ship is intercepted on the en route by a berserker who instead of just destroying it outright boards the ship um, attempt them to take prisoners. During this process, the Berserker and the artist open a dialogue where the Berserker asks the artist about life and the artist tries to explain why life is worth saving through the use of some of the artwork and why the artwork itself is worth saving. Um, it's an okay story. Um, I felt like it. I've read stuff like it before. Um, I feel like a story later on in the book also touches on some of these points, and I wasn't a big fan of that one either. Um, so this one got a 4 out of 10 for me. It was okay. The next story is called The Peacemaker, and at this point I started to get a bit worried about some of these stories in the book. I didn't really enjoy this one at all. This one's about a pacifist sent out to negotiate with a berserker who is en route to their planet. 
Um, the Berserker appears to be damaged and in need of repair, so the pacifist is hoping to to turn it away, or at least to buy some time, or, or anything he can do. Um, and it has a lot of the same, it touches on a lot of the same points that Patron of the Arts did, that humanity's worth saving because of our emotions, and our love, and our souls, and our artwork. Um, and I feel like we've all read that story before. Any time that humanity is asked why they deserve to live, it's always the same things. We love each other, we create great artwork, etc, etc, etc. Um, I think we're discovering that maybe maybe machines could also create great artwork one day. So I don't know how long how much longer that storyline has. Um, but overall, the story didn't grip me at all. But I did move it up a full point grade because the ending has a great twist surprise that I really quite liked. I, it made me chuckle. So I gave that one a three out of ten. The longest story by far in the book is called Stone Place, and I also think it's easily the book's best. It's about humanity's brave last stand against the Berserkers. Humanity has put together the largest fleet of battleships ever assembled and put it all under the command of one of humanity's greatest heroes that's ever existed. And they draw a line in the sand and say no further and it's time to halt the Berserkers' advance. The characters are great in this, in this story. We have some characters in this story that we will see again later on in the book. Um, which I think is one of the book's greatest strengths, is some of these characters are really well done. Um, in particular, the commander of the fleet is a really fascinating and interesting character, as are his political enemies, because there's a lot of political friction here. The commander of the fleet is, part, is from a planet that at one stage um, subjugated and mistreated um, the people of Venus. And the people of Venus are providing the vast bulk of the ships in this war. So being under the control of this man is is grating on them um, and there are plots within plots within plots um, but our main character is a marine commander from mars who has signed on not out of some heroic must save humanity sort of um, venture but because there's pay involved they're offering a large bounty for anyone that's willing to come fight the war for them and that's the reason he's there um, and his conversations with the other characters are really interesting and in how he ends up being entangled uh, with the fleet commander. There's action scenes and battle scenes in, in this one that are fantastic, the best of the book by far. Um, there's political intrigue I mentioned before, which is very interesting. Overall, this one was great. If the rest of the book was like this, I'd be giving the book a huge uh, rating. Um, I gave this story an 8 out of 10, um, and I really hope there's more stories like this one in the Berserker series. The next story, uh, What T and I Did, is um, I found very predictable. A man wakes up in a cell aboard a berserker. He has amnesia. He has an eye patch on. Everyone else in the cell seems really scared of him for some reason. He thinks it's because he's misfigured or something, but no, he seems fine. Um, they're all just really scared of him, like he's going to hurt them. And I found it predictable. Um, the science that it relies on as the core concept of the story doesn't work for me at all. Um, I just don't find it very believable at all. Maybe it was, you know, due to the book being from the 60s. Um, but no, this story didn't work for me at all. I gave this one a 2 out of 10. The next story, I almost DNF'd the book. It's called Mr. Jester, and the tone doesn't fit at all, I think. A man is on trial for the crime of committing practical jokes in a society and a planet where it seems that mirth and joy and laughter have been seen as inefficient and they are to be ridiculed and banned and they are illegal. So his jokes have caused a loss of man work hours and he's on trial for that and he is sent off to the far edge of the system as punishment. The story feels really out of place. Um, coming off the back of what T and I did, which I also didn't really like, I started to worry that, you know, we'd, we'd hit the high point with the stone place and we were just going to go well down from here. There is a berserker in the story, but all that does is serve to make the berserkers far less scary. Um, the berserker in the story is just an idiot. It doesn't make the smart sort of calculating decisions you would expect of this ancient machine intelligence. Um, and the story goes away to try and explain why, but it's just... It does, doesn't work for me at all. I gave this one a 1 out of 10, um, and it's at that point that I was concerned that I would 
be giving up on the book. Luckily, the next story was pretty good. Um, Mask of the Red Shift is about a transport ship transporting a very important corpse to basically the Emperor of hum the Human Empire at this stage. Um, because the Empire, the Emperor wants to see the corpse. But it's intercepted along the way. And a berserker infiltrates the crew of the transport ship and tells the captain of the transport ship that unless he takes this fake human that looks, uh, this fake berserker that looks like a human aboard the Empire's ship, he will kill his crew. We get to see the sort of laughably evil sort of people that become the Empire Emperor in, in these sort of stories and the sort of people that he surrounds himself with. We see the power structure at play. We see an interesting ship. We see, and the the Berserker itself is interesting in its mission and its goals and how it goes about them. We also see an example of humans using the Berserker's sort of almost programming against it, its single dri driven nature of its mission against it, um, which is really interesting. This one I quite enjoyed. It wasn't great, but I, it gave me a bit more hope for the rest of the book. I gave it a 6 out of 10. The next story, Sign of the Wolf, made me thankful that I didn't give up the book. I, this is one of my favourites. Um, it's set on a planet that has receded so far technologi technologically that it's forgotten technology. It's in a medieval sort of stage. Um, but there is technology around the planet. There are defence satellites. They're just not aware of them. There's, you know, there's technology here they just don't know about. And I, I love that sort of story where there's almost like a... I, I guess it's like a dying earth sort of story where we're in a fantasy almost story, but there's sci-fi elements there that the people aren't aware of. They interpret the technology as magic or the work of the gods. And it's always really interesting how that plays out, I think. In this story, we follow a shepherd boy who is protecting his flock from a dangerous wolf. Meanwhile, a, uh, meanwhile, a berserker is approaching the planet. And the counterpoint between the wolf and the berserker and the boy protecting his flock and the planet... It's really interesting. I, I thought it worked really well. I thought the prose in this one was the best of the book. I thought the dialogue in this one made the most sense to me. Um, the boy is looking for a sign from God for what he should be doing with his life next. And he's trying to interpret these signs. And maybe they're the berserker. Maybe there's other technology on the planet that's at work. And it's it's really good, this one. If, if you read nothing else, I think you should read uh, Sign of the Wolf. If you can track it down online somewhere. Um, you don't need any of the context of the rest of the story, I think. I think it works perfectly well as a standalone story, and I gave it an 8 out of 10. The next story, In the Temple of Mars. So, obviously, whenever there's a giant robot that's going to destroy everything you know and everyone you love, there's going to be a cult that for some reason worships that robot. And the Berserker War is no different. So, this cult has infiltrated the biggest, best ship humanity's ever made. The ship is on its way to the Emperor, and they are on board, awaiting the trip. They're going to attempt to kill the Emperor. They're going to attempt to kill humanity's greatest hero. They're here to try and cause trouble and let the Berserkers win, for some reason. There are no Berserkers in this story, and that, I feel that's a real detriment to it. The story itself is fine. Um, there's nothing particularly wrong with it. It's a fine cult on a spaceship story. There's some interesting technology involved. Some of the characters are interesting. But... As the penultimate story of the book, I just expected something a bit better. This story could have been in any sci-fi story, story collection that had nothing to do with the Berserkers. Um, it very hard, does, barely even mentions the Berserkers in the story. Um, and if it was in any other short story collection, or even if it was in the middle of the book, I might give it a higher rating. But as the penultimate story in the Berserker book, I gave it a 6 out of 10. It's fine, but it doesn't excite me. The final story was another one that made me thankful as I stuck through the book. It's called The Face of the Deep, and it's a story about a man who is escaping a berserker ship, and the both of them end up around a black hole. Um, they're in orbit around the event horizon, and it's a story about the man looking around, experiencing the weird space he's in, looking at the, the other things that are orbiting, coming to terms with the fact that he's moving faster than the speed of light, it touches on time dilation and gravitational effects. It's it's a really fascinating story, made all the more fascinating that it never uses the word black hole. 
And I had to look it up and I found out that, yep, this story predates the first published use of the word black hole by at least a year, which I thought was fascinating. So in the, in the story, it's called a hypermassive gravitational object, I think. Um, but every time I read it, I just read black hole because that's clearly what it is. In the story, we see the Berserker ship still behind him trying to figure out how it can still complete its mission of, of killing this man, despite the fact that they're in a black hole. We have the man coming to terms with all the surroundings and the weird space that he's in um, and trying to figure out, you know, can he be rescued? Because he knows humanity can't rescue him now. He knows no ship that humanity can create could possibly escape this deep down a gravity well. But with time dilation, the outside universe might be moving hundreds of times faster than him. So perhaps if he waits a week, maybe years and years will have passed on the outside and humanity will discover how to save him. Um, and he has all the food and water he needs. His ship will recycle his food, water, and air forever. He also has a cryogenic, or cryogenic freezing pod, so he could even just sit in that for thousands of years while the universe withers away outside. He doesn't know if humanity is going to be able to save him. He doesn't know if humanity is going to lose the war against the Berserkers. He doesn't know if a Berserker is going to come down and, and try and get him. As a story about a black hole from 1967, um, there's some science that doesn't really play out, I think, but... It doesn't matter. It, it, it all works in the story itself. Um, and it all seems pretty close enough. So I, I can't fault it there. And yeah, I loved this one. I gave this one a 7 out of 10. So overall, I think I did enjoy the book. Um, I really struggled in the middle there through um, through the Patron of the Arts and Mr. Jester. Um, and the Peacemaker. Those three were real low points for me. Um, but the rest of it was pretty good. Um, would I suggest reading it? Yeah, if you can find it cheap at a bookstore, it's worth a read. It's not very long, it's about 200 something pages, um, and the stories that are good in here are really good and worth reading. Um, you can skip the ones that I said were bad. Um, I definitely recommend Stone Place. Um, if the rest of the series has anything like Stone Place in it, I'd be very excited to read it. I love that story. The next book in the series, however, um, Brother Assassin or Berserker Assassin, depending on where it was published, is really expensive to pick up in Australia. Um, I think it's like 40 to $50 plus that again with shipping. So as much as I kind of enjoyed this one, I didn't enjoy it enough to spend that sort of price on the, on the, on the next one in the series. So while I'm not going to pick up the next one in the series online, I am going to look out for it at used bookstores and thrift um, stores. If I see it, I'm going to pick it up and I, I will read it. I'll enjoy it. Um, so I guess my highest praise I can give it right now is it's on my list for when I go to these stores. I am going to be checking out the S section in the sci-fi um, sections to see if there is anything by Fred Saberhagen. And if there is any of the Berserker series, I'll pick them up, depending on the price. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'd love to hear in the comments what you guys thought of this book. If you've read it, what were your favourite stories? And I'd really like to know if anyone's read further on in the series. Um, are they worth reading? Does it get better? Does it get worse? Is there more stuff like Stone Place with actual scary berserkers and humans fighting against them or is there more stuff like mr jester that just feels out of place and isn't worth picking up thanks for watching i'd love if you could leave a like or subscribe um, if you want to check out the rest of my book reviews the playlist should be about here and thanks very much for watching keep reading